is good. All the time, all the time, God is good. Yes, life is hard some days or years or months or seasons or places or in certain relationships or careers, life is harder than others. But life is hard, but God is always good. God is present and our joy is not dependent on our circumstances and our understanding of God's goodness is not dependent on our circumstances. God is good because it's who God is. And we want to be good because we want that to be who we are. So God bless you all. Let's open our hearts to the Spirit as we worship with joy and humility before the Lord. Let's sing, Come Live in the Light. favorite songs when I was a child. I loved it. It's because I have a banner that I made in Sunday school and, and I'd like us to have you all make these in steeple people or at a special retreat this year during the church year that you can hang in your house. Ours is still at the bottom of our stairs. My kids have grown up with it and it says God is the light of the world and there's a picture of a candle at the bottom. I had to do all the cutting out. I'm sure the teachers helped me but it's really inspiring because it makes sure that I remember that God is the light of the world and God's light is in me. Kids, do you know that God's light is in you? Do you know that God's light is in the person that you most dislike or that's hardest for you to be around? God's light is in every one of you. 
every one of us. And when you sing that song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, you're acknowledging that God's light is in you. And all you have to do is desire that God's light shines through you, and it will. How do we shine God's light? We spread joy and happiness. We're helpful. We're kind. We smile. We say thank you and please. And we do things that we're supposed to do. We keep our word. And we look for people who maybe are feeling sad or down. And we go and give them a kind word. We say hi. Sometimes it just makes a difference for someone to notice us. And so kids, shine your light. Shine God's light. And always know that God's light is within you. Every one of you. You have value. You have dignity. God's light is with you. God's love is upon you. God bless you kids. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Amos, chapter 5, verse 24. Listen for the word of God. Let justice roll down like a river, and righteousness like a never-ending stream. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Wonderful, holy God, thank you for being present with us. Thank you for calling us to listen. May your truth be spoken now, and may your truth be heard, and may it result in changed lives, ours and others. Speak, Lord, we are listening. In the name of Jesus, amen. In my 30 years of ministry, I've seen a lot of interesting things, as you can imagine. I've seen a lot of people who want to make the world a better place, who try to make the world a better place, who think that they are, and yet they are taking care of themselves and their own, and they're shutting the door to others. They're keeping people out. They're seeing the world in us versus them. You may know the story of one of our mission partners, that this has happened in Cleveland, not at this church, but at another church. And the kids were on their way home from school, and it was cold, and they were looking for a warm place to get inside. And they discovered this church nearby. The doors were unlocked, and though they were young, they learned to drink coffee because the coffee pot was on and the coffee was warm. And of course, they didn't mind it if they put the sugar and the cream in it. It tasted good. And then they started spreading the word and telling their friends because it was a safe place. Their homes weren't unlocked, or they couldn't get there, or they were abusive, or there wasn't food in the in the pantry or the refrigerator but here they came and there were little cookies and there were pictures of water for the church members and people who came to the church during the day the hospitality table was set well these kids thought it was wonderful that they had discovered this church until some people in the leadership of the church were hearing some concerns that the sugar packets were making a mess they probably were attracting ants as they spilled on the carpet. Some of the creamers were spilled. All the coffee was getting used up. It was costing a lot more to keep buying more. The food was getting eaten. The people who were coming for events during the day at the church, there wasn't anything left for them. And so the church made a decision to take care of their church and the valuables in their church that they would have to lock the doors because these kids weren't part of the church. Well, somebody heard about it, somebody with a good, kind, compassionate heart, somebody who was willing to look for solutions, and said, okay, we will create an after-school program where we can make a place safe and warm, cool in the summer, warm in the winter, for, people to, for kids to come when they don't have any place else to go, a safe place where they have food and they have things to drink, they have things to do, they have people who love them, and it's fun and they called it Open Doors Academy, one of our mission partners, because we don't ever want to have closed doors. We want to have open doors. We want to see all of us as one. But you can understand how that decision came to be. We can understand the concern, the self-protection, the, the worry that things would be broken or taken or suddenly the, it's not going to be in as good of shape as the building was before. Or maybe the people who are coming to activities won't want to come anymore. But instead of seeing it as only two options, leave the doors open and 
maybe some things get hurt or disturbed or it costs the church more money or lock the doors and keep the church safe, we could find a third option. There are always third options when we seek the will of God, when we open our eyes to God's plans and we ask God. Maybe they could have designated a room. Maybe they could have intentionally paid for and added it to their mission budget, their outreach budget. Food and drinks, activities and games, supervisors, tutors, lots of fun so that they would have laughter and safety. They would be welcome. It would be a fun place to come. But that wasn't an option that the leaders thought of. I have seen so many things in ministry. I see the good hearts and the good intentions, but I see how far short we fall. One time I was in the middle of preaching in one of my churches, not this one, but another one. And in the, came through the back door, the door opened and someone came down. He was holding a big spiral notebook. He was flipping through it. He was showing all the pages and he said, excuse me, excuse me. The Lord spoke to me and told me to come here and gave me things to say and I've written it down really long, really long. And I'd like to come and have a word. Well, I said, sure. Who am I to block the word of the Lord? That was not a popular decision in that congregation. His name was Michael. Michael could not have been happier. He followed the Lord. He was from a house that, where they made meth. His parents and relatives were addicted to meth. He was a meth and heroin user. And God was calling him to stop, change his life, sound the alarm about these drugs that people are using, the addictive nature of them, the harm that they're causing, how they're breaking up people and relationships and ruining lives. He trusted and believed God had appeared to him and he wanted us to know that. He was a likable guy and he did not want to go back home. He had walked miles to the church following God's word and he said the Lord told him that there was light in this church and he brought him here. And he didn't want to go back home to all that abuse and chaos. So he was allowed to stay in our manse, the manse that I wasn't living with in, but it was a Christian education building. It was the offices for the church. He was so happy. He praised God. You could hear him saying his prayers and his praises out loud. He filled up a whole other spiral notebook. We had to keep giving him notebooks to write all the words he was receiving from God, to write all his prayers to the Lord that he was lifting up and offering to heaven. They were beautiful, they were articulate, they were powerful and sincere and authentic. It was going great. He felt so safe. He said he'd never been in such a castle. We bought him food, we stocked the kitchen, until some people got a little concerned about safety, about what would happen to the building, about liability. We can understand, right? And so the decision was made that he would have to leave. He had no place to go. He had no driver's license, he had no vehicle, he knew nobody who was clean. And so they were gonna let him stay in our little stable full of hay that we use for our Christmas pageant each year. I couldn't bear to drive away. So I said, Michael, come with us, get in our car. And Michael came to be part of our family. Michael lived with us. He didn't look like us, he didn't act like us. It was obvious that he hadn't grown up with us. But there he went. When we went to all the kids' sporting events, there he was. People got to know him. When people came knocking on the door, kids and adults, he answered the door and said, Welcome, come on in, I'm Michael. He'd take the dog for a walk. People in the neighborhood got to know him. He'd go walking around the yard, talking to the Lord, saying his prayers. People got to hear him. We loved him, and he loved us. It was eye-opening to hear his experiences, to be in his shoes as briefly as it was that we could get a taste, a glimpse of it. He was with us for quite a long time. He changed us. He opened us up to God's spirit. I'm grateful that God led us to open our doors, not close our doors. And I wonder this day what doors God is leading you to open, to care for those in need. We have this prophet, Amos, he is known as the prophet of justice and righteousness because he was telling the people to stop mistreating those in need, the poor. 
He was telling the people to stop engaging in immoral behavior. He was telling the people to stop engaging in idolatry. So what is the definition of these three concepts that make up the basis of the book of Amos? So mistreatment of the poor, I offer this definition. The attitude that if it doesn't affect me, then it's not of concern to me. That guarantees that we're mistreating people in need, that we're mistreating the poor, when we only care about our backyard and we're not concerned with people out there and what they're doing. What is immoral behavior? Well, I offer this definition. Anything that will end up on the wrong side of history, that when people in the future look back, they will have come to God's truth because God continually leading us in this arc toward God's way of being for all people forever. And so when people look back, they will say, wow, I can't believe people thought that that was justifiable. Those were justifiable actions or thoughts or laws or beliefs. That's what I offer as the definition of immorality. And the definition of idolatry is putting anything as a priority ahead of God, putting our trust and our security in anything more than we trust in God. Amos teaches us, the word of God comes through Amos, stop mistreating the poor, stop engaging in immorality, and stop worshiping idols. So the whole gist of Amos is woe to those who are complacent, that are living joyfully and happily while mistreatment of the poor is going on while people who are in need are hurting, while injustice and unrighteousness is happening. Woe to you who are, who are complacent, that you're just not focused on all of those who are in need. This hits really close to home in our luxurious United States of America. Many people in the United States are not living luxuriously. But for those of us who could pretty much say we have a shelter over our head and food to eat, and we have love, and we're not living in fear. We are able to just go about our lives, and we have a choice of whether we want to pay attention to those in need and figure out how to help them, or whether we want to ignore them. So one of Amos's famous lines is this, hear my word, says the Lord, you who oppress others, you who crush the needy, you who deprive those who are poor of justice in your legal system. You who levy taxes on the poor while you live in mansions. You who oppress the innocent and then gather for religious assemblies with joy, thinking that you're pleasing to me. You who accept bribes or deprive the poor of what they need or trample the needy. You do these things, it says in chapter 4, and then you nonchalantly say, let's have dinner. These are the things that people are doing. And the Lord says, this is unacceptable. You feel secure as you lie in your fancy beds, as you lounge on your nice sofas, as you eat your choice food, as you drink your wine, as you use fine lotion, as you play and listen to beautiful music, but you don't grieve the plight of those who are hurting. The Lord says, I abhor your pride and your complacency. If this is not a word for us, if this is not a word that puts the fear of the Lord in us, then we really have closed the doors of our hearts. We really have closed the doors of our worship spaces we have closed our minds to the pain in the world. My friends, woe to those who are complacent while there's pain all around. So let's look at this book of Amos. It's nine chapters. It was written in the 700s BC. Amos was called to be a prophet to Israel. And Israel was during a time in their history similar to ours. There was great prosperity. There was great peace. They were not at war. They were not living in danger. The people were living wealthy lives. They had power militarily and politically, and yet there were people everywhere 
but maybe behind closed doors or maybe on the other side of town who were hurting, who were in need. And Amos, the name, means burden bearer because Amos was given the burden by God to bear the word to inform the prosperous nation of Israel of God's impending doom and judgment upon them for being hypocritical, for loving being the people of God, for loving their religious assemblies, for believing that they were pleasing to God while they were looking the other way or just weren't looking to see, that weren't noticing, they weren't seeking out. Who are the people who are hurting? How can I help them? You know, God gave Amos five visions, metaphors, to make the coming doom uh, tangible for them. And so Amos shared them. The five visions were of a plague of locusts, of a destructive fire, of a plumb line, of a basket of fruit, and of the destruction of the temple. Now, the locust is pretty obvious, right? No one wants to have the swarm of locusts around. The fire is pretty obvious. No one wants to be in the path of a horrible fire that's killing and destroying. The plumb line, those of you who are in the construction industry know that the plumb line is used to kind of determine true north and keep things straight. And God was saying, I'm tired of this crooked and perverse generation. I am going to bring an end to it, the plumb line. I am true north, God says, and we are going to set everybody back on the godly path. The basket of fruit, God was saying, the time is ripe for me to finally bring judgment upon the people who are ignoring the poor, who are welcoming immoral behavior, who are putting their security in things other than God. And the destruction of the temple was foreshadowing what was to come. So that is the the outline of Amos, what are we to do? We don't want to leave this message with despair. We don't want to finish reading Amos and feel down and out and discouraged and lose hope. What's the point? That's not at all the message of God. The message of God in Amos is don't lose hope. Open your eyes. Who are your neighbors? Who are the people who are hurting? Look for them. They are everywhere. Do not just care about yourself and your own and your inner circle. Look for ways that people are hurting and figure out how to care for them one by one, group by group, system by system. So what do we do? The first thing, we desire to care, to change, to stop mistreatment of the poor in our own lives and in our country, in our world. Number two, we ask God for help. God, show me. Speak to me. Let me know what you would have me do. Open my eyes. And number three, as we do that, we open our eyes. We actively, intentionally look. It's like God brought me Michael. I didn't have to go looking for Michael, but my prayers every day are, God, show me who I can help. And one day, Michael comes walking in. Now, if you keep praying to God, open your eyes. God will open your eyes. So be ready. And, and then care for those in need. Take care of yourself, take care of those close to you, and then keep widening the sphere of influence so that we don't just engage in our wonderful religious behavior while there are people who are hurting. Like in Jesus' day, they were lying outside the temple and people stepped over them. We don't ever want to do that. I remember living in New York City and being on my way to Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, which was our place of worship. And my friend came to visit from Washington. And we were in a rush. We were walking from the Upper West Side down to the church. We were hurrying. We were in our good church attire. And I kept losing my friend because she kept stopping. She was also active in her church in D.C. And she brought lots of money with her. She even had some candy bars and energy bars and food. And she kept stopping and giving them to those that we were stepping over in the city. Please, dear Lord, let us not step over people. Please, dear Lord, let us take care of others. What is the message of Amos? Let justice roll down like a river. 
and righteousness like a never-ending stream. And it will be so if we care for others and if we make our lives count. Let's pray. Wonderful and holy God, speak, lead, transform, change, help us. Help us let go of fear that causes us to close doors and shut people out. Help us to do what Jesus tells us in Matthew 25, to feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, clothe the naked, care for the sick, visit the prisoners, welcome the outcasts. Help us, O oh Lord, to be sincere. Help us to understand that there are ways that we can care tangibly. If we're willing, you will put people in front of us, like you walked Michael down the aisle, like you made Anne Marie begin Open Doors Academy. Speak. We pray together with trust in Jesus Christ as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing how great is our God. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide It trembles at his voice at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands. partners to us that we can bless our mission partners if you look at our outreach page on our website cwr.church you see how much we care about ministries for those who need shelter who are hungry who are in prison who are in need and we care for them and we want outcasts and those who are marginalized to be welcome to know that they are unconditionally loved so if you want to bring justice and righteousness as Amos 
calls us to do as God speaks through Amos, I encourage you to continue to bless our ministries so that we can continue to be powerful change agents with our mission partners working for justice in the world. And now go forth with the power of God upon you, the blessings of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit this day and forever and ever. Amen.